Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, this is Robert Pellicciotti. And if you're here today, you're here for the presentation on the MCAS grade level and competency portfolios. We're gonna begin in about a few minutes, this meeting or this presentation is scheduled for 1.30. I think there's probably some people coming in right now. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of the presentation, I just wanna talk about what we're gonna to discuss today because I wanna make sure everyone is in the right place for this particular presentation. We're here to discuss MCAS all grade level and competency portfolios. What are these portfolios? These portfolios are for students that are performing at or near grade level. Again, they're at or near grade level. These are students with disability, a significant disability, who often cannot participate in the MCAS test, but they're not what you would consider a typical MCAS alt student, meaning that they're not their skills are not significantly below level. So we're gonna talk about students who have some skills that are at or near grade level, but um, are unable to participate in the test. So that's the focus of today. If you're not in the right place, and you thought you were signing up for MCAS all training, um, you can certainly look at the trainings resource center webpage on the MCAS all and see if there's other trainings that you're supposed to sign up for. I know we have some recordings that are gonna be on that page. You can also call the department with the questions um, if you're looking for a training that you didn't that you thought you signed up for, but it wasn't the correct one. So I'm going to talk for probably about 40 minutes today. I'll try to keep it as short and direct to the point as possible. We're going to talk about these type of portfolios, these MCAS grade level and competency portfolios. We're going to talk a little bit about not just what they are, what type of students will be well suited for them. I'm going to give an overview of the requirements, just a basic overview of the requirements. I'm not going to get too many details because it would be hard to retain all of them for the presentation, but I'll give you resources where to find all the requirements if you have some students that are going to be com completing these portfolios. I'll also talk a little bit about the submission due dates, and I'll also talk a little bit about just very briefly about the appeals process and provide some excerpts, little excerpt of what a grade level of competency portfolio would they look like. I will, at the end of the presentation, answer questions that are in the Q&A. Right now, I do not have the ability to do so. Um, I do have on hand Deborah Hand, who is the MCASL coordinator, and uh, Kevin Froten, who is our contractor from now Cognia, who's gonna be assisting with the presentation. So a big thanks to both of them for helping me out today. I really appreciate it. And let's get started. Let's move on to talk a little bit about the process here. Let's see, make sure this works. There we go. All right, move this over. So let's talk about what type of students or who should be considered for a grade level or competency portfolio. What are we talking about? Well, as I mentioned briefly earlier, we're talking about students that work or have skills that are at or near grade level. These students have some skills um, that are not only at or near grade level, but we know by working with these students that on standardized testament, standardized assessment and some classroom exams, it's really difficult for the students to show what they know. But these students have a particular significant disability that prevents them from de demonstrating their skills. There's, um, if they participate in the MCAS test, sometimes we feel they're, it wouldn't be an authentic measure. But the typical MCAS alt test that is based on entry points that are significantly below grade level. Those, um, if you will, those entry points that are based on the essence of the standard are below that are below grade level. Their skills, these students who take this grade level portfolio, their skills are more advanced than them, than that those skills would measure. And if a student were to take the traditional MCAS alt, the highest score a student could get would be considered progressing. And a progressing score is not the same as a partially meeting expectation expectation score, it would still be a not meeting expectation score. So they would in essence not be able to, to pass or get a partially meeting meeting expectation score or exceeding expectation score. And if they were to do a grade level or competency portfolio, they could attain a score that's equivalent to the standard MCAS test. Again, by completing the grade level or competency portfolio, a student with a disability could attain a score through a portfolio that's equivalent to the standard MCAS test. These slides were sent to you with this, a presentation link. And if you use these slides and you went down to the link here for MCAS grade level and competency portfolio manual, you would click on that link and that would take you to the manual that's been updated this year with the new requirements. And this other link will also take you to the MCAS grade level and competency portfolio webpage where we have a variety of resources, um, a little introduction about the grade level and competency portfolio. 
So let's move on to talk a little bit about some more students or examples of students that could be well suited for a grade level and competency portfolio. So let's talk about some students that could be well suited for a grade level or competency portfolio. We're talking about students in, we'll give three examples or three categories of students. We're talking about students that maybe have a significant emotional or behavior dis disability. A student could have a significant health related disability or a significant motor disability. Let's say if a student with a significant emotional disability is working in a classroom, they have some at or near grade level skills. We'll say they perhaps have, well, lack of a better word, low frustration tolerance. These students become very frustrated easily when they're facing a challenging task uh, like MCAS that requires them to switch gears. And we know that for them to sustain concentration and focus for that period of time, it'd be very difficult. So in classroom work, sometimes the teacher is able to develop assignment or uh, assessment in such a way that the student is able to show their skills. But the format of the MCAS test would be uh, challenging for the student. They may perhaps um, have an episode, if you will, you know, leave the classroom, uh, become frustrated, um, lack of a better word, meltdown, so to speak, um, rip up the test. That has all happened before. So we want to figure a way we can get an authentic assessment for the students without creating a, a scenario that requires that um, causes their have, have significant emotional frustration. Other students have significant health related disabilities. Um, they're unable to meet the physical demands of testing. Perhaps they, you know, if they're low stamina, they can't complete the test in a single day um, due to their particular health challenge. Um, whether that's stamina related, uh, could be a temporary, or it could be a medical condition as well. Other students have significant motor communication disabilities. They really struggle communicating. They have to get different AT systems. And for them to work with a person one-on-one -on -one to complete an MCAS test, the entire test session in one day, it would require an extensive time and so much effort they wouldn't be able to get an accurate reading of their performance. And the educators working with the student feel that, you know, the student perhaps could get a score partially meeting expectations if we could figure out a, a good way to assess them through maybe a portfolio. I'm going to move back to this other slide to give you everyone an example of what we call a decision tree. So as you can see, this is an example of a decision tree that's in our MCAS Accessibility Accommodation Manual. And it's also in the Grade Level and Compensate Portfolio Manual, as well as the MCAS Alt Manual. And this gives you an idea of how we want to determine what would be the best assessment or the, perhaps the most appropriate assessment for any student. And there's a series of questions it asks regarding does a student have a disability? If so, can they participate in the test? Um, with or without accommodations. And you can see here on the bottom, there's three categories or three options. One would be a student would could either take the MCAS computer-based or paper-based test in the appropriate content area, ELA, math, or science, technology, engineering, uh, with accessibility features or accommodations. Another option would be a student would take either the MCAS computer-based or um, paper-based test with or without accommodations. The, um, and that the student uh, may be considered for a grade level or competency portfolio. So that would be the other option. Or if the student meets all the criteria above, they could be considered for the MCAS alt. And the criteria above for the MCAS alt is listed in this particular area, civic and disability, substantially below grade level, intensive individualized instruction, unable to fully partially demonstrate knowledge and skills on a standardized test, even with the use of accommodations. But again, here for the traditional MCAS alt, they're substantially below grade level of expectations. The MCAS uh, grade level or competency portfolio, they have similar skills um, in the sense or similar challenges. They have trouble demonstrating the skills on standardized tests. However, their skills are at or near grade level. And therefore we have the option for that grade level or competency portfolio. Again, this decision tree is a resource. It's available in all of our um, accommodations manuals and the MCAS manual. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about what is a grade level portfolio, just give a brief overview of it. How is it similar to an MCAS alt and how is it different than the standard test? So again, a grade level portfolio is for a student that's in grades three through eight. So the student will be in grades three through eight. We have a competency portfolio for students in high school that I'll talk about later. And this grade level portfolio is a portfolio, meaning that's a collection of work samples. There aren't data charts, there aren't entry points like a traditional MCAS alt. What, is, what, what this is, is a collection of work samples taken together that demonstrate the student has knowledge and skills of the grade level standard. There are specific requirements for each area. 
for example, for mathematics, for a student in grades through three through eight to complete a, um, a grade level portfolio of mathematics, they would need to document through these work samples that they have understanding of 10 standards. 10 standards. For English language arts, they would have to document the understanding of three standards in reading for literature, three standards for reading for informational text, plus four writing samples, four writing samples, and one writing sample has to be in each text type. For science, technology, engineering, there would be a student has to document a total of nine standards, three standards in each of the three selected disciplines. Again, so there's our basic requirements are listed here um, in the grade level and competency portfolio manual that I directed you to earlier that you can look at your link. It details the requirements and a little more specificity. But to give you an example of documenting each aspect, let's say you have a student in fourth grade. And the student in fourth grade is going to be completing a grade level portfolio. And one of the requirements would be they would have to demonstrate their, their knowledge, um, knowledge and skills, and we'll say in mathematics, operations, and algebraic thinking. And so these work samples, they have to document, they have an understanding of specific, of specific standards. One standard we'll look at in particular would be, um, what's, what's like a standard algebraic and operational thinking uh, standard A1? which would be interpret a multiplication equation as a comparison. Interpret 35 equals five times seven as a statement that 35 is five times as many as seven and the seven times as many as five. And the, for the student to do that, they'd have to represent verbal statements of multiplication comparisons as multiplications equations. So in this particular standard they have to document, the educator would have to review this particular standard develop work samples that assess the standard at that level and making sure through multiple work samples that the student demonstrates each aspect of the standard. So they would, perhaps one day the student could demonstrate one problem then, and there would be one work sample. The next day the student would demonstrate another or two problems. So they would collect all of these and they would submit these as um, work samples for the student. So let's move on to the competency portfolio. You know, how is that different? Well, the competency portfolio is very similar to a grade level portfolio in that, it, again, it's a collection of work samples. The collections of work samples are the grade level expectations. So a student in high school, we would expect these work samples to have a high school complexity. The reason why we differentiate competency portfolios from grade level portfolios is for two main reasons. One, a student in high school that's completing this portfolio has a path for graduation. If they reach a score of par the expectations are above, they can earn their competency determination and hence get their diploma. So sometimes we hear that a student who is taking a portfolio is unable to earn their diploma. If they're taking the traditional MCAS alt, that's correct. But if they're doing the competency portfolio, there is a pathway to getting a diploma. So they can get a similar achievement level to students taking the standard MCAS test. I just want to keep in mind or let everyone know that for the next generation assessment, there are new passing scores that are listed here on, on this particular slide. For the next generation English language arts test, 455 is the current score that's equivalent to 220. And for math, it's 469. So there's a new scale um, for high school tests based on the next generation test as a new partially meeting expectation score or a new score for the student to get their CD. These are referenced in our graduation requirements website. I just want to give everyone just a little background on that. Another main point or difference for the competency portfolio is that these portfolios are considered cumulative. What do I mean by that? I mean that if they're submitted in high school, they're returned with a feedback form. The feedback form provides the educator compiling this form and the student important and specific information on how the student performed on specific standards. This allows the student to take that information and resubmit that portfolio the following year. If the student got credit for some of the standards they submitted, they wouldn't have to resubmit that work, they could build upon it. So for a student in high school, if they submitted a mathematics portfolio in grade 10 and they received that portfolio back in grade 11 and they had certain requirements filled, they could just add on to that and submit it again the following year in grade 11 and, and thus forth. So each year they could add a little bit before the, in order for them to earn their composite determination. That can't be done when the students in grade in grades three through eight. It's only a one-time shot grades three through eight where they would get the results. What are some of the basic requirements for a competency portfolio for students in high school? Well, for English language arts, 
They're based on the next generation curriculum frameworks or the 2017 curriculum frameworks. And the student for English language arts would have to produce four essays based on text plus two short responses. So what's considered an essay? An essay is considered at least four or five paragraphs, multiple pages where a student responds in, a high, in what we said a grade 10 level way to a grade 10 level text. Short responses would be much smaller, maybe a couple paragraphs to a grade level text. This allows the educator to work with the student on a particular grade level text. If they were reading Grapes of Wrath, for example, they wouldn't necessarily have to read the whole text, but they could read a segment of it. And the educator would read a particular, would design a question based on the text they've read together, and the student would produce a written response. For mathematics, the requirements are, um, are specific. We would, the student would have to complete 15 standards or clusters of standards from the five conceptual categories. So for, as I mentioned earlier, since this portfolio is cumulative at the high school level, if they sub students submitted in grade 10 and got credit for maybe five of the, of the standards, they wouldn't have to complete, recomplete those five standards. They could work on the 10 they did not complete that year. So it allows students who have not just a disability, specific disability, but perhaps have interrupted learning, have some retention challenges, the ability to work over a period of time and demonstrate those skills over a period of time. What are some of the requirements for science? Well, for science, technology, engineering, we have some requirements that are quite specific. For the biology portfolio, the student would have to do a total of eight standards. Five, sta five standards are required in that we provide information on which five standards would have to be completed. And three dis standards are con just considered discretionary. What does that mean? It means that the educator working with the student can review the requirements of biology, the curriculum framework ones, and determine which discretionary standards would be appropriate for the student. Perhaps a student is really adept at learning life, um, the life cycle, and they're working with a student on um, ass assignment or quizzes where they demonstrate their understanding of the life cycle. In physics, there's a total of ten, uh, seven standards that have to be completed. And five of those are required and two would be discretionary. The reason why there's a difference between um, the number of standards in physics and biology is it has to do with the aspects of the standard. In order to demonstrate the understanding, um, the student has understanding of the particular standard, they have to demonstrate and understand each aspect. Some of the standards in physics, the required ones, are much more dense. They have a lot of aspects. Therefore, there's less standards to complete but in the knowledge would be equivalent. We would still collect or still um, accept portfolios that are submitted on legacy standards. If, for example, the student was, the portfolio was submitted before and the legacy requirements are based on the 2006 STE curriculum frameworks and, the and for the requirements, the student would have to demonstrate their understanding of 10 standards with at least one standard addressed in each strand or major topic area. Again, these requirements are described um, in specific detail in the grade level and composite portfolio manual. This is a little reference slide of a cover sheet. Um, why do we have a cover sheet? Well, we have a cover sheet because these portfolios are submitted similar to MCAS Alt in a similar way, but they're not at MCAS Alt. So we want to differentiate them between a standard MCAS Alt that's based on the grade that's based on standards below grade level to this type of portfolio that's based on grade level standards. So on our website, there's a cover sheet that an educator would use when they're submitting these type of portfolios. What I wanna draw everyone's attention to is the ability to check off each subject area, English language arts, mathematics, science. So there could be a student that for a variety of reasons, perhaps is unable to demonstrate the true knowledge and skills um, through the standard MCAS test in one subject, but and would be a appropriate candidate for a grade level portfolio or competency portfolio in another subject. So a student could sit for an ELA test and submit a grade level portfolio of mathematics, or perhaps their skills are significantly delayed in one area, like English language arts. They're gonna do a traditional MCAS SALT in English language arts, and they're gonna do a grade level portfolio of mathematics. So just because they're doing a grade level or competency portfolio doesn't mean they have to do it in every sub in the all major content areas. As I mentioned earlier, I was gonna provide some excerpts, or I'm gonna provide some excerpts of what are some grade level and competency portfolios. 
And this would be an example of a grade level portfolio that was submitted at one specific math standard. If an educator is working with a student and they determine this was the best course of action, a grade level portfolio, they would identify which standards have to be addressed. They would get a work description. They would complete the work description and attach that to a specific work sample. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you see a work description label, it includes a space with the student's name, the date the work was produced, the grade, um, the content area, this happens to be mathematics, um, the particular strand of domain, so it's the NBT stands for number based on operations. And here is the section where they could describe the particular standard, a learning standard read and write multi-digit whole numbers using base 10 numerals, a description of the activity, the student had to compare multi-digit numbers using a less than, greater than, and um, equal signs. There's an overall level of accuracy and independence, and there's accommodations. I'm gonna talk a little bit about accommodation and independence later in more detail, but you notice the student has accommodations for the work read aloud and still 100% independence. So accommodations do not affect the level of independence. And you can see here, what attached to this particular work description cover sheet is the work sample. It's scored and it's also dated. So these two pieces of evidence would have to be submitted for each work sample, the cover sheet and the specific work. It's dated and it's indication of the student's skills, how they got there. What's an example of a competency portfolio? Very similar, there's a cover sheet and indication of the particular strand or um, standard being assessed. In this particular instance, it's number and quantity from a competency portfolio. They've identified what particular area it is. Accuracy, independence, the student had to get 90% accurate. So they got a question wrong. And what accommodations, if used any, calculator accommodations were used. What was the student asked to do? Solve the problems using the order of operations. And here is the particular task the student was required to complete. Again, pretty straightforward. What's important here is the educator understands the standard being assessed. They're working with the student and they're designing work in such a way that the student can complete and demonstrate their knowledge and skills. I mentioned earlier that for competency portfolio, there's a specific feedback form that's provided to the school. Well, this is an example of a feedback form. What does it look like? It has information on the date of the review, um, the particular school, and how it was scored. So I'm gonna draw your attention to the specific detail that in this type of feedback form. This happens to be for mathematics, where the requirements under geometry is GCOC. So this particular um, letter notation of this standard is indicated here. And then a content expert score who's reviewing it looks at some categories. One, they're looking at, is the work at grade 10 level complexity? This indicates a Y indicates yes. Is the work accurate and complete? No. So something was missed. Something was not complete. Something was not accurate. Is the work of 75% uh, independence or higher? Uh, yes. Yeah. So it was, it was grade 10 level complexity. It was the student completed the work independently, but what it wasn't accurate and complete. Well, what happened? In this particular area, the content expert reviewer indicated the student needs work on isosceles triangles, problems involving ratios of angles. So they completed a lot of the work aspects of this of this particular standard but they missed a couple aspects so they would work with the educator work with the student and design problems that assess the isosceles triangles and problems involving ratio of angles to resubmit that portfolio again this is just an example of a feedback form that's provided for the competency portfolios there's a similar one for english language arts and also for science they look at the level of complexity accuracy and complete um, independence, and they provide an overall rating of the of the evidence. S would stand for sufficient. I would mean insufficient, meaning that more evidence needed. U is unmatched, meaning the work they submitted was okay, but didn't seem to make sense. It wasn't matched that particular standard, and, and it's not submitted. So, we'll talk a little bit about this year and students working with educators. I acknowledge that last year was different; that a lot of students were working remotely. Um, the expectation for a lot of uh, schools and students is that they're obviously in person. They're working at, um, with this educator in the classroom. However, there could be still some students with disabilities that for some reason related to disability or condition, they're unable to attend school in person. So can these students complete a grade level or competency portfolio? Yes. 
an educator working with them could complete a grade level competency portfolio with them if they're uh, completing their learning virtually. You would just have to make sure that one, the student's IEP indicates a student must participate virtually. The student would complete the work during regular or routine class, trip, class time. Um, the work sa samples were created by the educator. They weren't completing some online program and the educator just collecting these from these kind of off the shelf online program and submitting them as a student's work sample. So the educator is actually creating the work samples. Um, sometimes they can use a screen share and the educator could take a picture of their screen if they're holding it up. And then on the particular work description cover sheet, the educator would state that the student work is authentic and the student was work virtually. <clears throat> Again, if a student required to be learning virtually, it's possible to do it. Here's some information on what would need to be included um, for the student to be able to complete the portfolio virtually. I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes about how these portfolios are gonna be scored. Um, content experts are gonna at, look at all of the strands and standards that are submitted. So basically, as I mentioned before, if there's 15 requirements, they're gonna make a determination that are all 15 standards submitted or clusters of standards for the mathematics competency portfolio. If there's not 15, they can still submit the portfolio for the competency, um, but they wouldn't get credit at that time. They would just get feedback. They look at are each aspect, is each aspect of the standard included? If the standard requires the student to demonstrate their knowledge of associative, cumulative, and distributive property, and the student demonstrate their knowledge of associative, cumulative, but not distributed property, the student would not get credit for that standard. Is the work at the grade of level complexity? If they're in high school and the student is reading a, for English language arts, complete a competency portfolio, and the educator required them to, we'll say, read Charlotte's Web, they wouldn't necessarily be considered high school level literature. Therefore, th there would be a question on, is the student actually providing um, grade level appropriate work? Would that be considered of enough complexity to score to credit for that? We look at the student's response, are they accurate? Um, independent, 75% or above. So the work would have to be a, a certain level of independency and accuracy. There are also in information on what we call prompts and independence. So I mentioned earlier, 75% independence. Let's think about how is that rated or scored? Well, it's scored by the educator. And for these type of portfolios, it is possible for the educator to cue the student in the sense of reminding the student to perform a particular task so they demonstrate their true, true knowledge and skills. But the educator is not providing the student an unacceptable support by showing the student a sample problem, um, giving the student a cue like, oh, you need, this is how you answer that question. But it would be acceptable for the educator to remind the student to use their reference sheet, remind the student that it's working quite quickly to go back and check the work. Remind the student that another draft is needed. Remind the student to use accommodation that's available. If the educator provides those gentle prompts, they would take off a certain level of independence, maybe 10 to 15% based on the number of prompting they're providing or cueing they're providing the student. If the educator, if the student required um, significant prompting or cueing, you know, that they forgot how to solve a problem, the educator solved the problem for them, it's okay, now finish the task. This, the student could still complete that task, but if they submitted it and the educator explained that in the work description cover sheet, the student would not get credit for that. As an alternative method, what could be done is if a student requires a lot of prompting and modeling, they could use that as a teachable moment. The student could take that test. The educator could remind them, okay, so this is how we solve this particular problem. Um, this is how this, the steps we need to take. Tomorrow I will, or this afternoon, I'll give you another quiz based on what we talked about today. So they can give another quiz and use that quiz as the work sample. So not the one where they required a lot of prompting. A lot of the work samples, it is very important to show the work, meaning they have to be designed in such a way that we understand how the student came to their answer. Um, it shouldn't just be a work sample with just answers um, or multiple choice or matching. It's a hard with that those type of work samples to understand how the student got to their answer. For English language arts, we would want to see an example of the text, if it's not a well-known text, or the title of it, how the student got, what was the student used to get their particular answer. For students in high school, I'm going to talk briefly about 
to competency determination to graduation. So for a lot of students, the, what's the main goal? For most of our students, I should say, the main goal is graduation. They have to earn their competency determination. When the student is in high school, a student with a disability, we know that students can stay in school until they're 22. Sometimes these students are taking the MCAS out at an earlier age in preparation for taking the standard MCAS test. Sometimes they're doing a competency portfolio. Once they take the, the grade 10 level test, whether that's an alt, um, a competency portfolio, or sit for the test, the students potentially could be eligible for what we call the appeal process as an alternative pathway for graduation. I'm not going to go into all the aspects of the nuts and bolts of the appeal process. I just want everyone to know that there is such a thing. And the appeal process is not, oh, I was a good student, therefore I should be awarded the, the CD. It's an alternative method of demonstrating their knowledge and skills, that they have the knowledge of skills equivalent to a student passing the test. If you have questions about the MCAS performance appeal process, please let me know. I just want to let everyone know that it exists and it's an option for students who are participated in MCAS in high school, whether that's to a competency portfolio, taking the test, or an MCAS alt. And it's important to know that for the MCAS appeal system, performance appeal system, there's a new online process. There may, uh, you may not be doing this at your school, but there could be a guidance counselor or principal that submits appeals. If they're submitting appeals this year, um, the, actually the newest appeal, the, the next appeals date would be in November, the first Friday of November, and this would be done online. It's a completely online system. Previously, we had a mail-in system where schools would print out the application and mail that with the supporting evidence to the department. This is all done now online using the security portal system. If you use the links in this website, it will give you information about this particular process. So I should say if you use the links in this presentation, the security portal, the district directory administrator, and the step-by-step -step guide, they'll take you to the website and give you information about the online process and how to submit the appeals. In talking about cohort appeals and the graduation requirement, I mentioned earlier there's a new scale score. Just be aware there's a new um, not just a scale score, but there's a new appeal score range coincide to the that coincide to these scale scores. And this web page is just should be or this slide should just be used as a reference to understanding that. I'm not going to go into that many details about that today. If you have questions, let me know for the sake of this presentation. The uh, discussion about the appeals a process would um, this would kind of be overly lengthy for today. So, how would we start about how would we start completing one of these portfolios? What would be the steps we would need to take? Well, first, obviously, we want to determine what type of students this would be appropriate for. As the beginning of the school year, we're working with these students. Oftentimes, educators have worked with these students before, especially if they're in, they're not new to us. We have some base, we have some information based on their MCAS performance, how they did last year, what would be an appropriate option that the IEP team would meet, and they would determine whether a grade level or competency portfolio would be appropriate perhaps as the standard MCAS alt, or they would participate in the MCAS test with or without accommodations. If they determine that a grade level or competency portfolio is uh, the appropriate option, they're going to have to figure out how to start completing this task. What are the requirements? They're going to look at the grade level and competency portfolio manual, look at the basic requirements, what they have to complete for the student in that particular grade. Um, they're going to have to determine um, who they're going to work with. How are they going to start collecting work samples? Oftentimes, special, ed special educators are really adept at modifying work for students, but they're not always often very versed in the curriculum framework requirements. Um, some of these students are inclusion classrooms. So it's going to be really important that edu special educators are working with the uh, general education um, teachers, the curriculum coordinators that work with the student to determine what work samples are required how are we designing work for the student in the inclusion class and collecting that work so we can use those work samples as a basis for those portfolios. It's just really important not to be working at one of these portfolios independently. Oftentimes, sometimes an educator may be assigned to one of these students, not as a one-on-one, -on -one, but you know, closely working with the students because these students have specific disability. But we want to make sure they're not working in isolation. They're going to need the support of uh, the curriculum coordinators, the general education teachers, and as well as the principal with, with time allotted to complete these particular tasks. They're gonna to have to review the curriculum frameworks um, requirements and portfolio. 
And once they start collecting work samples, they're going to have to be aware of the submission due dates. For MCAS grade level portfolio, the submission due date is the same date um, as MCAS alt, which would be April 1st, um, 2022. If you have any questions about this process, please let me know. Um, I just want to give everyone a baseline of some steps that we need to take, take to start beginning collecting work for a grade level portfolio. This slide is used just for understanding of some resources that tasks that school districts and educators could use to collect um, evidence for portfolios. We have some samples, some excerpts of portfolios on our website, um, the MCAS out grade level and composite portfolio website, as well as the appeals website. Um, we also have some some past feedback forms to look at so you can see work of previous submitted portfolios. There's also perhaps a student in your district that submitted a portfolio before um, when they're in high school and you want to resubmit it, you want to make sure you have that feedback form to determine what standards need to be addressed. If you use these particular links on this slide for the portfolio samples, um, you can see ones that scored a needs improvement or the prior human expectations range. They're posted on the MCAS appeals webpage. There's also some work samples that are posted on the MCAS grade level and compensate portfolio webpage. Let's see now, I don't have any more slides. I wanted to make sure I have some time for questions today. And let's see if there's any questions in the Q&A. If there's something I didn't cover in the presentation, something you had questions, please feel free to ask those now in the Q&A. And I'll certainly try to get to those. I'll answer them live right now. And then after this presentation, I will send out um, a written Q&A to everyone who signed up for the presentation. So the first question is from Josephine. She asked, at what point do you have to choose if a student will take the regular or um, MCAS or the competency portfolio? That's a good question, Josephine. A decision can be made at any time regarding how the student's gonna participate in MCAS tests up until the student participates in a test in the spring. However, if you have a student in high school that, you, that you're thinking about for a competency portfolio, it's really important to have that indicating the IEP as soon as possible and start the educator start collecting those work samples. They certainly could use work samples throughout the school year, but it's really important they're, they're collected with a portfolio in mind so we know what standards are gonna be addressed and they're dated and scored correctly. So as long as the work isn't from a high school level, grade nine and above, um, you can use those work samples for a student for a competency portfolio. And again, it would be important to identify as early as you can the school year, but it is not required to do so. Could be a, you could identify the student right before, up until the day of the test. I have a question from David. David asked, how should the use of grade level competency for portfolio be addressed on the IEP, specifically in the assessment page? It gives the option of the MCAS or MCAS alt. How should we indicate the student submitting a grade level competency portfolio? That's a good question, David. Um, the, for the assessment page, that is a lot of schools have a third party system they use for those um, IEP page developments, whether that's Easy IEP or ESPED. I would identify it as a portfolio under MCAS alt and specify it that's a grade level portfolio under the comment section because it's not a standard test with, the, with um, accommodation, it is actually a portfolio. So that's how I'd identify it on the IEP. Uh, another, there's a question from a number. It says, I saw that students who haven't yet passed the competency portfolio can submit more materials the next year. Is there an option to sit for the regular biology test if considered appropriate, if the needs change the second year? Certainly. So let's say, for example, you have a student that's in grade nine or a student that's in grade 10. The student has a student with a disability and you're uncertain how the student's gonna perform the test. At sometimes in routine assessments, the students are able to show their skills. Sometimes they struggle. So you give the student the, the standard MCAS test with accommodations or without accommodations. The results are in at that point. If the student is unable to pass their test, uh, unable to make their the minimum score, you certainly can begin the process of collecting evidence for a competency portfolio. And then you can work on that competency portfolio and resubmit it up until the student usually turns a year, usually turns the age of 22, because at that time, 
um, districts typically stop educating the students because they're no longer required to. It doesn't mean the students still couldn't work with the district, but districts typically stop because they're not required to educate the student past the age of 22. I have a question from Jason Small. He says he's a, a, a student in 10th grade who attempted a physical science last year. Can he submit a portfolio for biology this year with the ELA and math? Certainly. So if the student took the MCAS test, let's say, I think he's saying physics last year. It doesn't mean he has to submit a portfolio in, in physics. He could work on a biology portfolio and they could work on an ELA and math portfolio. One thing is important to note is that for accountability purposes, when the student participates the first time in grade nine in science or grade 10 in math and ELA, they have to choose one method. They can't in grade 10 for math, take the MCAS alt and sit for the test. They have to do one or the other. But after that, they're certainly available to take all retests, options are available to the student. Um, and they certainly could work on the compensate portfolio process as well. Allison asked a question last year, we completed a, we completed online and was able to submit evidence for the grade level portfolio. Is this still an option this school year? Um, that's a good question, Allison. I think you're asking about the MCAS alt uh, process for forms and graphs, where those forms and graphs are completed online for grade level portfolios. Um, that's still an option. However, I believe the binder itself for grade level portfolios has to be mailed in. I, I'm, and I'll, Kevin will chime in if, if that's still correct, but I believe the binder itself has to be mailed in. Uh, yep, that's correct, Rob. It's still a, a physical binder. Um, so if, if the question was, can you still do online remote work, um, which is a little few and far between this year, but I assume, Rob, that's still acceptable as long as it's documented properly that um, they could do remote online work as well. All right, well, thank you, Kevin. Question from um, another one, Rainey, do students who complete an MCAS portfolio and not get a high school diploma? Um, complete MCAS, not get a high school, that's a good question. So I'm not really sure the, the exact question, but I could tell you this. If a student completes a traditional MCAS alt, meaning an alt that's based on standards that are significantly below grade level entry points, it is not possible through that mechanism, that path to that uh, type of portfolio to get a diploma because that's based on standards below grade level. If they some complete a grade level portfolio, it is possible through a, a competency portfolio and grade level portfolio that are based on the grade level standards to get their competency determination and to graduate. Um, it is also possible for students with disabilities to work on the appeals process, the alternate pathway to diploma as well, or to take the standard tests. Again, their traditional MCAS alt, if a student score is progressing on that, they're, they're unable to get the diploma with the score progressing and, and if they're in grade 10 on their standard MCAS alt, they'd have to go with another pathway, that'd be a competency portfolio or an appeals process or take the retest. Just to reiterate my from clarity, MCAS all portfolio has to be uh, 10th grade if that's when MCAS is, uh, but then it could do a composite portfolio, retry MCAS in later years until they're 21. Um, in grade 10, the student can do one method, meaning that they have to choose a particular method. They can do, the student can sit for the MCAS test, one option. They can complete a traditional MCAS alt, which is another option or they can do a portfolio, a competency portfolio, which would be the third option. That's in grade 10 for math and ELA. After that, the student has participated once for accountability, all options are available to the student. The appeals options, the retest, the portfolio. Brian has a question. For math competency portfolios, does this mean there are roughly 48 to 50 aspects for a completed portfolio? That's a good question. Uh, Brian, what I can tell you for a competency portfolio of mathematics, my screen is still sharing. There's 15 st standards or clusters, if you will. Let me just tab over here. And I'll show you 
to escape one second here. Uh, bear with me while I find this. Here we go. So I believe everyone can still see my screen. We're going to navigate to the grade level competency portfolio. So if I come down here to MCAS and I look at the comp grade level competency portfolio website, I see the manual listed right here. I'm going to open this up in this particular manual. There's a little background information and the requirements itself. I am going to scroll down to the requirements for mathematics. Next generation requirements where for competency portfolio, it would need a total of 15 clusters or 15 standards. If you also bear with me while I go down here and find it, scrolling quickly. And we come here. Okay, so you asked about the specific aspects. Here would be the specific aspects for number and quantity. We have little check boxes to identify which, to help you identify what has to be complete. I haven't added them all up, but they have to complete for number and quantity for competency portfolio, submit at least four examples solved correctly by the student for each aspect of the three clusters identified. So there's three clusters or standards, NRNAA, NRNAB, and QA. For each of these clusters, there's some specific excerpt or specific, I should say, aspects. Here for nRNA, there is one, two, three boxes. Those are aspects that are specific and you have to be four problems for each. So you would need four problems for evaluate numerical exponential expressions, four problems for evaluate um, numerical expressions involving rational numbers, and four problems where you would rewrite exponential expressions with variables using the properties of exponents. So four, eight, 12. So for this, you could imagine for a student, we'd have a worksheet, have 12 problems. If they got all 12 correct, they could get credit for this particular standard. So I don't know exactly how many would require, but it gives you an idea of the number of um, problems the student would have to identify in particular work samples. So this they could potentially with one sheet have, they could potentially at the minimum have 15 work samples cover the 15 standards, but most likely it'd require a little more, especially as the standards get a little more dense. As I scroll down here, you could see how for algebra one, two, three, four, there's four particular aspects. And perhaps it might be too challenging for a student and for one quiz to demonstrate all four aspects which would be a total of, um, let's say 16 problems on one worksheet. I hope that answers your questions. Let me look for another one here. Allison, for the grade level portfolio, does the skills survey have to be completed? No. So there would not be a requirement to complete a skills survey for a grade level portfolio. However, if you completed a skills survey, it gives you a good idea of maybe a, whether a grade level portfolio would be appropriate for the student and you could, you could submit it, but it's not required. So we perhaps went over a little bit. It's 2.17 now. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to put my email up and um, bring it up here. So in the screen share, so you can email me after. It's my first name, dot my last name at mass.gov. I'm going to answer one more question from Brian. Secondly, how do you submit digital work from last year with paperwork from this school year? Well, for a appeals process, online appeals that are submitted um, digitally, you would simply photocopy that work. Um, you could take a picture with a phone or something of that nature and convert it to a PDF. For th the traditional MCAS alt or grade level portfolio that's submitted to Cognia, like that way, um, th th they could just be printed out and put in the binder when those MCAS alt materials are, are requested and submitted. Let me pull up my particular information here show this slide. So if you have any questions, please feel free to call the department, 781-338-3625. You can also email me afterwards. I really thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and day to listen to this presentation. I hope it was informative and helpful. 
I know there's not many students that fall into the category of a grade level or competency portfolio, but for those students that do, I feel strongly feel this is a good way to get an authentic measure of their skills and also give them a pathway for graduation later on. Again, let me know if you have additional questions and I'll certainly email the answers after presentation. I'm going to sign up, but there's one more question. Oh, Jason said thank you. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and hope you enjoy the rest of your week.